I came up with this title about six, seven months ago. They're real and they're local, Area's Best UFO Cases. And I don't know if I'm going to be true to my word because uh, in the intervening time, I went to the uh, MUFON Symposium out in San Jose this year, and they gave all the state directors a disk of the Pandora Files, which is a project that MUFON came up with, you know, Pandora's Box, of giving you all the, the files of everything in the kitchen sink that was ever sent to MUFON that had to do with your state. So it was really kind of neat. I walked down memory lane. There was some uh, stuff that Ted Blocher did. There was some stuff that uh, Larry Bryant was involved in. And of course, Dick Hall and some of the other names you've heard of. And Isabel Davis. And you know, the, the, the fund for UFO research has a long history in the area. And that kind of blended into everything else people sent in, as well as just news clippings, just everything in the kitchen sink. And it's really a fun reading, and uh, I wish we had more in the database having to do with Virginia than, than we do, because it's, it's a lot of fun to pick through that. So I'm going to show you some of those, and they're just kind of unvarnished uh, PDF files. And it's kind of interesting, as, as MUFON puts uh, some security on there, so it would just take me more time to try to break them apart and cleanse them and so forth. <laughs> so please don't take a lot of notes on the witness names and all that craziness. Like, let's not go there. but. Uh, you know, um, we'll, we'll, be ha we'll be looking at some of those, like I said, just the raw files. But I did pick out some very interesting ones for us to check out. I wanted to give an update on this case. This is my lung case, as I call it, a gentleman from a rural area of Virginia. And you heard the story a million times, but he contacted me in the year 2000 saying that he'd had this odd experience, that he woke up, he went to bed, and then he woke up on a, a metal table that was soft. And there were some very tall, for lack of a better word, what we call in the field Nordics, the, the blonde Nordic type. But they did have very olive skin, too olive to be human. And they had big blue eyes and long, longish blonde hair. And they were operating uh, a machine over his chest, which, which made pulses of light and heat. And these pulses of light and heat felt really good. He wasn't too disturbed by it all. But later, they were pulling, for lack of a better word, some slides or images out of a machine. They were talking gibberish in their own language. And they basically said, we're sorry, but we've hurt you very badly. And that was the telepathic message he got. And then the next thing he knows, he's back in his bed. He starts pacing, what the heck was that all about? You know, His wife's dead asleep. The kids are asleep. He can't get anybody awake to be part of this nightmare he had. He's pacing around the kitchen, you know, drinking coffee and smoking and trying to process the whole thing. And eventually he goes back to bed for a couple hours, and then it's time to get up for work. Well, he starts having a cold. It gets worse and worse and worse. And finally, after about 10 days, remember, this guy's only about 30 years old. And he was, he was a smoker, but, you know, he's not overweight or anything and never had a lot of problems. But he just got this really bad cold, and he limped into the emergency room, and they said, you know, every winter you get a cold or bronchitis and you limp into the emergency room and we take an x-ray and you have clear lungs and we send you home. And then not this time. They said, you got a mess in there. You're going to have to see the cardiologist and the pulmonary guy and we're going to have to admit you. Well, it turned out his, uh, the pain he was feeling in his chest is mainly from his heart being in a prolapsed position. His heart was in a prolapsed position because there was so much fluid filling up his chest cavity, compressing one of his lungs. The other one was about to collapse. No room for his heart to go. A big mess, very uh, life-threatening situation. They did drain the fluid out of his chest cavity so his lungs could reinflate. And he went from there to local pulmonary people and then up the food chain till he ended up at University of, of in Charlottesville, University of Virginia, the best people. And they basically have done all kinds of tests. This is a really short version of a five-year story. But this is a CAT scan. He gave me his CAT scan disc, which Normally, it's not a sickly green, but uh, this room has its peculiarities here. But uh, it's kind of a bluish white with uh, the black there. I blacked out his name, obviously. At this point, he's 36 uh, as this, this situation progresses. But basically, his lungs, they told me his lungs got fried. It had very sudden uh, extreme trauma, and the blood and the fluid was leaking out of his lungs, and the, the edges of his lungs were singed and black. And it was a very sudden thing. And they kept saying, you know, did you you know, freebase some weird drugs, or did you get caught in a house fire, and this kind of thing. Do you have access to fissionable materials, you know, nuclear burn? That was the initial stages. By the time he got to Charlottesville and the UVA people, they're, they're on a much higher plateau of, of health care, and they said, no, this is not an inhalation damage 
this looks like you got stuck in a machine uh, too long some kind of machine, an x-ray machine or something. And they said, we can't even fathom what happened here. And they said he needs a double lung transplant. And so they've looked at all kinds of tests on his lungs. They did one that was a, a vascular test to see how much blood flow went to each lung. And it came out exactly 50-50 because his, his damage is so completely like, uh, you know, a, a mirror image. And they said it's so symmetrical. That just, <coughs> just doesn't happen with lung disease. You know, you get a, a bad lung and, an, and a better lung. You know, you don't have this kind of pattern. So they, they don't know what to make of it. And of course, he won't tell them anything. He's afraid to death. And now he can't work because he's considered disabled because the doctors say, even though if you feel good, you're, you, a cold can kill you. You have such little lung function left. So he can't work. So his wife left him. And uh, he's got you know, three little kids. But they're doing pretty good. He's got a really good spirit. And um, he's, a, he's a fighter. But the, the only update I have on the case is I uh, had five x-rays of his and his CAT scan. And I, I gave it to a doctor on the West Coast. He's uh, an emergency room physician, reti just recently retired. However, he's been specializing in lung problems because he's a big crusader for clean air. And he's really gotten involved in what diesel does to your lungs and what this kind of particulate does to your lungs. So he's really up on, he's been testifying on Capitol Hill and everything. So he's really up on lung function and, and pollutants and so forth. So um, anyway, he, he issued a report with himself and a woman a radiologist who's a real specialist. And it's a, very, it's a thick report, pretty much just backs it up. I mean, there's no big punchline for me to pull out of the report. I would like to say that there was. There is one tiny, tiny punchline. She said that on the, on the first images, which apparently is time-wise would be before this, this incident occurred, she could see the tiniest little bit of um, tiniest little bit of, of something sort of like an emphysema process, just the tiniest bit. And he said, you know, I would have missed that, especially in a busy emergency room. I wouldn't even have looked at that. Even if I looked at that x-ray for 10 minutes, I wouldn't have seen that. But it's true. She blew it up and blew it up and really teased it apart. So, I mean, that, that's about it. I mean, almost infinitesimal damage, uh, you know, and I don't have the wherewithal to say that that's consistent with somebody that might have spoke, smoked for 15 years. I don't know. So that's where we are with that. It's just we just have a second opinion based on the CAT scan. The CAT scan, as you, as you may or may not know, but it's a disc that has its own viewer. And you can actually like cruise through three-dimensionally through someone's body. And um, so uh, it, it's pretty, pretty exhaustive. Uh, but it's just caught in time. It's a snapshot in time. So it's, it's not like we have a progressive CAT scan of all these different time uh, parameters. But, but it's, it's an intriguing case. I mean, he definitely has very severe lung damage. His lungs have, have improved ever so slightly, and they have no idea why. He keeps smoking. So, um, which is, you know, they, they both, the report, the, and most report is, please have his patient stop smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, but his lungs are gradually improving. So even his, his regular doctors are, are loath to have him do anything different. You know, this guy is, is, is a dead person walking, you know. Um, you know, I mean, people have said to him, this, the technicians and stuff said, they've never seen this kind of lung damage on somebody alive. You know, it's usually a post-mortem after a fire kind of thing or something, you know. So, um, but anyway, that's all I have on, on the update on that case. Uh, more could be done. He wants to donate his lungs to ufology, but I, I don't know how to go about that. But, um, but he's, I did speak, I did get an email from him I'm just really recently, just a few weeks ago, and he seems to be doing good. You know, he said he wished he could see me and so forth. This is just something that I pulled off ufoevidence.org, which nobody knows who puts that website together, so it's a little bizarre. But it's a nice website if you can understand things, things are not investigated there. But I found this case, uh, you know, basically Pax River, so uh, I think Bruce was involved with this. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Bruce Maccabee, who, who works for the Navy. But this is um, a case where this, this woman wrote in that it was about 1, 1 a.m. She approached an intersection that was strangely dark. And then she suddenly realized this very black and huge craft was lowering itself down. It was hard to see, kind of black on black, but it lowered itself down. I forget the details about whether there was lights at any moment, but all of a sudden, you know, that was the last thing she remembers. Then she woke up in this room that I know this is a little hard to see, especially with the, the green tint added, but this was a curved room. And I've never heard this, pre this precise description. I'd like to see what uh, David Jacobs, that's another reason I pulled this out. I thought maybe David Jacobs could lend some uh, expertise on this. 
I've had many, many people tell me that they are shown uh, lots of pictures of people in like a Rolodex or sometimes they're walking past on a stage. I've heard, I've heard of variations on this theme, but this is the first time I've heard this. This person said there were hundreds of chairs and in each chair very neatly set was a framed picture of a person. And for some reason, the person felt, this abductee, for lack of a better word, felt that great elation. This is really great. This project's really great. I'm going to meet my dead grandparents. For some reason, the person just felt this ethereal feeling like they were going to be reunited with their dead grandparents. And then she meets this uh, kind of, if you can barely see it, kind of scary looking uh, person that tried to reassure her. And here's a close up. And the first thing she thought of in her mind was, wow, that hair is really wrong. That hair is really weird. <laughs> it's like plastered on there. It's like from the 70s or something. And, um, you know, she said, uh, you know, boy, that hair, in her mind, she said, boy, the hair is really weird. And the being said telepathically, oh, we just do that to try to comfort you. You know, I don't know how comforting it is. But, the, you know, this woman seemed much more concerned about and freaked out by the hair than, than the being itself. And she said, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad that you're real. You're really real. This is really exciting. And she still felt this uh, uh, elation. And then she walked by looking at all the portraits of the people and didn't recognize anyone, but still was like, well, where's my grandparents or something? Anyway, this being led her over, and the, the being was very excited about the project as well, and led her over to the two specific chairs and said, don't you recognize these people? And she said, no, you know, I'm, you know, Lily White Anglo-Saxon, these people have color. I don't know if they're half Indian or Pakistani or, you know, I, I don't know these people, you know. And at that point, supposedly, the being got very cold. She felt this complete coldness overtake the being. The being was no longer excited about the project. Something had gone wrong, or maybe it was just a, a testing of her wits. I don't know. At that point, some other beings came in, and they had a huge hypodermic needle with some orange fluid, and they gave her a shot, and that's the last thing she remembers. And then the next day, she woke up and had a bad bruise on her, on her arm with a little spot of blood, like she had been given a big syringe. But I just thought that was an interesting story. Like I said, there's no way to really follow up these stories because they're just uh, ufoevidence.org. It's one of those mystery sites out there. Nobody really knows who's putting it together, what, what, what's up with it. But people have logged in some very fascinating uh, sightings. And there's some search engines that sort of work on the site. Sort of not, but anyway. But uh, a weird, weird deal there. I've never heard of uh, portraits propped up on chairs and hundreds of them like that. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Pandora Project. Like I said, it's just all the files throughout the U.S. Uh, broken down by state. In my case, I'm a state director. Uh, I've heard rumors the board members have the whole, the whole nine yards, every state. But for what it's worth, um, you know, I do have the Virginia files. I'm just going to show these raw files, like I said. It was a little more trouble than I thought to break them apart and so forth because uh, MUFON did put some security on there. So we're going to... I'm going to have to go over to, to this. Um, let's update later, shall we? OK. All right. OK. I know you can get smaller. OK, let's just, let's just see what's going on here. here. Here's a letter from Lebanon, Virginia, a person r writing to the fund at Box 277 Mount Rainier. Dear sirs, I happened uh, to be watching Rona Barrett this week. I heard the comments which were made concerning UFO sightings. It caught my attention and caused me to want to tell you about an experience or sighting that happened to me and my family. One afternoon, approximately 13 years ago, just at the edge of, of dark? dark, the edge of dark, that's right, my son, who was riding in with his bike, he came inside and wanted me and my wife uh, and daughter to hurry and come outside and see what there was. And um, let's see, it was just disappearing over a low hill and then reappearing several times, kind of bobbing over this hill. I just want to speed it up a little bit here. Um, it moved towards us slowly, not making any sound at all, until it would pass directly over us and then behind the small hill. Around five minutes later, it would appear and follow the same uh, path and procedure and doing this, whatever, t twice or several times. There was a bright light, like a blue searchlight, would shine on the formation of small white lights, and they would then return to the large um, craft <laughs> flying inside of it, out of sight. Each time, 
uh, the searchlight would be uh, extinguished and these, these other objects would be flying around. I want to get more to the chase. <clears throat> to me, it looked like a building, a skyscraper that had been erected of steel beams uh, with, uh, before the brick or stone had been used to complete it. And then by some unearthly means, the whole thing lay on its side and became airborne. There seemed to be 20 or more round shapes or uh, dome-shaped compartments throughout the length and width of this object. And small twinkling lights could be seen inside the, this maze of girders on steel beams. But anyway, I want to just get right to the drawing, which I think is, um, please don't take his name down. Okay. Ah, wouldn't you know. <laughs> Stopped right there. How nice. Um, okay. There it is. But isn't that fascinating? You know, here's this 1,000-foot gigantic object bobbing along around this hill and um, with these compartments and different lights doing different things. And uh, you know, it gets very detailed, the twinkling lights and this and that and all kinds of things going on. And I just thought that was um, um, I almost forgot to mention the fact that the craft would stop or hover over almost directly over a small Appalachian pow power company substation, not directly, but close by, off at an angle. So it was um, in the vicinity of a power station. Okay. Let's see if we can... Uh, I've lost it. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, we don't want to be <clears throat> going crazy. Come on. Okay. Uh. Somebody else's computer, you know, it's tough. Just <laughs> come on, open. That's all I want. I know you can do it. Let's put this down. Okay, here we go. I guess it's back there somewhere. Okay. This is a, a report taken by Fred Whiting, who was uh, Secretary Treasurer of the Fund for UFO Research for, for many years. I just find it interesting, all these things just ended up uh, in the MUFON file somehow, because they also wore, wore many hats. These, But here's this uh, light beam coming out the back of this, this object, the first sighting and the second sighting um, of this person has had many sightings. And th this is a typical of the old form with the different check marks of what the person saw. It was hovering, it was descending, it was over a building, it was over fields, different terrain. It was very fast, and you know there was mental telepathy, dreams. They were curious. They were elated. They had a religious experience, the memory lapse, and a time lapse. You know, all these things are going on. A bad headache. They've also marked skin rash, sluggish feeling, neck muscles ached, arm muscle ache, leg muscles ache, spinal column ached. Wow, that's that's a detailed checklist, and they felt colder. I thought that was interesting. But this is another entity type of case, and they ended up drawing the, the, the being. Uh, had a thin covering over the head, no hair was observed, uh, a one-piece jumpsuit, nose was very small, baby-like, slanted eyes and eyebrows, small baby-like thin ears and mouth, and a belt with some kind of device on it. This is a case from 74, I think it was. Um, Small disks with strange lights. Uh, UFOs crash together, but there's no damage apparent to their craft. I observed this whole thing standing and looking at stars. The two small UFOs or saucers collided, then went in opposite directions. I saw a UFO escape from a plane quicker than you can ever realize. The messages, reasons for interest in our species. The sons of God, the beings of other planets, come from heaven and other worlds to Earth. Our time is running out. Some have been taken up, possibly kidnapped to other planets. Some will be destroyed. Others will be saved from catastrophe. When Jesus comes, these beings will show themselves openly amongst us. Okay, that was that person's take on it. Um, and on and on about, you know, Thanksgiving Eve, a big mothership came over, and so forth and so on. This was, um, fr this is Fred writing to Walt Andrus, the head of MUFON at the time in Seguin, Texas. I finished a preliminary report behind her encounters, a 35-year-old woman who lives with her parents and works as a hospital housekeeper. She was an individual with very low self-esteem, my psychiatric nurse friend, 
who was present during the interview, agrees that her maturity level is not much past adolescence, but she was responsive to my questions to the extent her memory would allow. She held back on one piece of information. She said the aliens told her where their bases are. In a subsequent telephone conversation, she finally relents and says where they are. They're at the Great Lakes, the Bermuda Triangle, and the Japanese Triangle. I don't know, whatever, and Jupiter moons or something. But not much. He, got, he puts not much to go on. But uh, but these are just kind of typical of the type of sightings. All right, let's go with that last one. I found this one interesting. This was uh, in Crittenden, Virginia. I'm not sure where that is. But this was a one where the Air Force got involved, and because Larry Bryant got the Air Force involved, uh, some some things never change as you look back through history. But this is a Air Force Form 117 UFO sighting by a Mr. Lupton. It's being forwarded to you for further study. This was uh, the subject of UFOs, and apparently it's like Lieutenant Colonel Swansiger replied to the attention of, and it goes on about in response to a card received from in the March of 19, 1969 from a Mr. Larry Bryant, a civilian employed at Fort Eustis. Dis discussed the sighting with him. He wanted an immediate statement as to any or all findings of Mr. Lupton's sighting. I, had, I informed Mr. Bryant I had no information to disclose, et cetera, et cetera. And this is uh, written by Everest uh, Worthington, it looks like, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force. But that's neat. Attachments were the AS, um, Air Force Form 117, the NICAP form, a postcard from Larry Bryant, and, then, and a road map was also uh, included with this. The reason I, this case is, you might think it's kind of prosaic, you know, boy, this is getting boring, and, and it sort of is, but here's where the, the person d did the drawing of what they saw. This is an example of how to do the drawing, and, the, and this is how the person drew the drawing, so keep that in mind, because at one point, the Air Force says the diagnosis was it was a helicopter, and... Um, There is a punchline to this. It's actually, uh, he said it was a very unusual noise that it was making. Look at this drawing. And there's a better example of the drawing, so I'm going to move further down. But that's not, doesn't look like a helicopter to me. Cigar sh shape with, with, with uh, an o oval lights uh, highlighting it. But this is the interesting thing. They tried to blow him off and say it's just a helicopter. But here's the interesting thing. The guy's uh, a test facility mechanic at NASA. And he graduated from NASA apprentice school. He was with the Navy prior to that for many years as an electrician. I don't think he's going to make a mistake that something's a helicopter. But uh, they still tried to tell him it was a helicopter. It's, uh, it was self-luminous, uh, reflective, transparent, a, 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 very, a combination of those things. And uh, let's see if we can get to... This is interesting. This, this whole list is, is filled out. People who heard the sound. Apparently, it was extremely loud. You know, ecl different towns even. But we have full names and uh, little towns they lived in Eclipse or Carrollton, Virginia. A telephone operator on the phone call could even hear the noise and said, "What? What the heck is that?" A Sunday school teacher, you know, heard the sound. So apparently, this was um, not a helicopter. But he was asleep at approximately 10:30 p.m. At that time, he was awakened at 3.24, exactly, uh, by an unusual sound. The sound was similar to the hum of an electric motor or a transformer that was in the process of going bad. The sound was changing at an even rate, very loud to normal, or a little lower than, than, ba than back to, to loud again. The noise was changing at a constant rate, as far as my ears could tell. I said, what in the heck is that? What is that noise? Et cetera, et cetera. And then he has the sighting of this um, unusual craft. And uh, I, just, I just found it interesting because he went into an awful lot of detail and his background uh, gives credence to the, to the case. He tried to go back to sleep and this and that and the other thing. And he wondered who else may have seen or heard what he did. And that's, that's when he starts doing his own little investigation. Somebody else heard an explosion, but he said he did not hear that. But in his inquiries uh, around, someone else heard. And here's, the, um, here's a better view of it, of what he drew. Approximately 100 feet, the view from the bottom, the blinking lights were going around apparently, continuously blinking, nose and tail identical except for the blinking light. Couldn't have any idea of the shape of the top, and it was a silvery, shiny color. Uh, he has X's and Y's and Z's to denote certain areas of the craft, so it's a very, uh, some sort of dividers were between those, what looked like windows with light shining through the windows. 
It's just an it's just a it's an interesting uh, case. And there's a lot of paper paper trail on this. Federal Aviation Administration gets involved. Um, a review of our records did not reveal any reports of cigar-shaped objects or unusual noises. Your information, flight progress strips, and tape recordings are retained for a period of only 15 days and then destroyed. So there's considerable helicopter activity in the area, however. You know, that comes up again. Um, anyway, but it, it's just interesting, all this uh, paperwork that, that was able to be pulled together into this, this case. I just thought that was uh, worthy of note. Okay. I really don't like Vista. You know, it's hard for me to navigate in Vista, but I will... Let's see. I think I'm just going to, let's, let's see if I can't get back to where we were. Oh, wait a minute. Here it is. Here we go. Okay. This, uh, I don't really have another slide. We're going to see plenty of slides with, uh, Diana has a bang up presentation and uh, I, I've been able to glimpse it uh, the last, last several months. It's a wonderful thing. She's, she's discovered all these great drawings from her experiences and her roommate's experiences back in the day when they had those experiences. And um, that's going to be great. So this would have been more of the same. In fact, some of the drawings were so similar that the woman in this case uh, wanted to know if somehow they had shared a drawing or that, that subliminally they had shared a drawing or something strange went on there because some of the drawings were so similar of um, some of the individuals seen. But um, let me just, and it, there's, there's not much, let's see, oh, I screwed up. Okay, let's, let's go. There's not, there's, wait a minute, <laughs> there we go. This is um, a case, it's not the real name, Emily. This, but this happened in suburban Annapolis, so I thought that I would uh, discuss this case just for a little while, which <clears throat> my little while is, is, is uh, ending quickly here. But uh, I do have an audio tape that I believe is already loaded in here. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background on it. This particular case is a case that actually, he's not here yet, but this was a big case for David Jacobs. This, this case actually was sort of a, a bellwether case that he writes about extensively, fairly extensively, in um, The Threat. And this, this case was a turning point for David Jacobs. I'm going to just set this up real quickly, and then I'll put the audio tape on. And this woman's a real chatterbox. If you don't hear what she just said one sentence ago, don't worry, because she's one of these people that describes everything three or four times from every angle. You're not missing much if you miss one sentence. But she's 30 years old, mother of two, and to this point has not had much trouble in her life, except recently she's had this kind of bizarre poltergeist activity. And reviewing the tape, the poltergeist activity was far more pronounced than I thought it was, than my memory serves. But she goes into quite a bit of that, which I will just bring you up to speed very rapidly on. They had a lot of intense poltergeist activity to the point where the husband had made a gun cabinet and it wasn't really locked. It just had a big rod that went down and somehow fastened. He wasn't able to find the right hardware for what he really wanted to do. It wasn't locked per se to an adult but it was, um, you had to coordinate yourself and, and so forth. And her children were very young at that time. I think her daughter was like, her daughter was seven. I think her son was like five. And they, they couldn't, didn't have the strength or the, the reach to, to pull it off. But eventually the husband was going to get an actual lock. And there were some historic guns, one from the Korean War, and just some guns that had served in the military that their family members had. And um, I didn't get the impression they were hunting every other weekend. I got the impression this was just kind of like keepsake uh, firearms they had. In any case, she, she would always lock the door, dead both do the door, and yet things would be moving around the house. They were, she said she was neat as a pin, a full-time mother, and she'd walk across the carpet, and there would be the remote control for the TV just in the middle of the carpet. And, and what the heck, you know, how did that happen? And this went on over and over. Things would be stacked up. Things would be f uh, just in disarray. And it was over and over again, and she can't figure it out. One time she turned the... It's, it was a big, apparently it was a big piece of furniture, like in the, this is a few years ago, so it was a big stereo, CD, turntable deal. And she turned it on and played the music, and then she just took her daughter to school and came back and turned it on and it wouldn't work. And she thought, oh no, I'm going to get in so much trouble. My husband gave this to me for my anniversary, I've only had it a few months, it's not working. When he came home, they found out that what happened was uh, one of the plugs you know, from the machine went into this other set of plugs, this extender thing, and then it went into the wall, 
And it's one of those things where, you know, you know how tight those things are. It was like, it's like you had to wrench them back and forth to even pull them apart. But somehow that got pulled apart. And so he had to move the furniture, which is very heavy, just to get back there. And he said, how in the world could that work loose? That is so tight. And she goes, I have no idea. And I always lock the door. I turn the deadbolt with the key. I don't know what's going on. But these things were going on, and they were not, you know, shake off one or two, but it was getting to be very bad. At one point, the gun cabinet was open. There were, uh, ammunition was on the floor, and they called the police, obviously, and the police, and there was a gun missing. And the police said, oh, it's probably just your kids. And they're like, it's not our kids. I mean, we tell them not to get them near there, don't touch that, and they really don't even have the reach or the strength to pull it off. I mean, I, it, it's not the kids. I, I just don't believe it's the kids. And, but the cop said, well, let's just go look around in the yard. And she's thinking to herself, is this guy on drugs? Look around in the yard. But sure enough, he, he start, kicked some dried leaves, and, and the gun was in the leaves. And, and, and she was like, that is so weird. And he kept kicking around. He also found like a high-powered shotgun, uh, not a shotgun, a high-powered um, like a slingshot thing. And she was like, what the heck? You know, I mean, it was a manufactured thing. It was like it said high-powered on it. And she's like, what is that? So it just sounds like maybe teenagers or whatever, but it's still very odd, and, and there was no explanation given for that. And these kind of things, and she said, how could that be? You know, I'm locking everything. I, I don't get it. But anyway, she, she, so she started feeling like her friends were telling her, maybe you have a stalker. You know, he doesn't really take anything, but some guy is just getting in there. He's just showing that he can get in there. And, you know, so her mind was going nine different directions. So she got in the habit of bringing the kids home uh, from school, and then she would say, you, know, you stay in the car, and she would actually go in the house first and look around first before she would bring the kids in. I mean, this became a real problem for her. Well, that was the only thing odd in her life that she could identify to date until one night. Uh, she wakes up in the middle of the night. Uh, she's very confused. There's weird lights dancing around. She looks out the window, and she's thinking, oh, wow, the police are here. It looks like a big SWAT team. There's lights everywhere. This is great. Maybe this will stop this poltergeist stuff or this... Um. She never thought it was poltergeist. She never used that word up until this moment. I mean, she used to think it was just some nut that was stalking her or something. And she thought, well, maybe this is it. Maybe this is like the, the drug house down the street. Maybe I won't have any problems after this. But then she began to realize, wait a minute, that's not really a police car. And why would it be on our lawn? They wouldn't pull up on our lawn. I mean, there's plenty of room in the cul-de-sac. What's going on here? And her husband wouldn't wake up, and you know the kids are sleeping real hard. Her dog won't even get up. Her dog Ginger, the dog's name comes up. So anyway, that that's the that's the scenario that uh, she's she's. This is her first uh, odd thing that she can really say this is really weird. So I'm just going to play a little bit of this, and then I'll have to stop because Rob's going to beat me over the head here. Okay. Now does this microphone on? Or, I mean, I'm trying to make sure that people can hear this, and I'm not sure how to achieve that goal. I don't even know what button to push, but I'll try to remember. Okay, this says play. It's supposed to be on. Okay. Kirk Enterprise. No? No. Foolish question. Why don't you think the mic would work? Well, you don't Nothing. think it works? Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Can, is it? Have a little out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. He's going to try to make this audible. You want to control it? Move it in. Oh. What am I doing? <laughs> Meanwhile, all kinds of noises. Hello? No. Let's go with his. June 18th. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning, definitely around that time, I'm going to say. And um, I had been thinking all along, I hope, and this was just an ongoing thought ever since this police stuff. I was thinking spooky stuff. Other people were telling me, oh, your father's trying to get in touch with you, like I said. I'm like, no, 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 it's not good stuff. This is some fruit loop who's coming to my house and just saying, I can come to your house if I want to. And my brother Ernie said he was afraid that I had a stalker. And I said, oh, that's gross, but, you know, it could be. I mean, I've seen it on TV. Things like that do happen. So um, I 
just be real really careful all the time. Always careful when I came in the house. I would leave the kids in the car. I'd come look through the house. Then I'd get the kids ready. It was horrible. It was just, it was like being under siege all the time. Um, what happened was, I was laying, I had on going, as I said, thought every night, I hope that the cops catch who's ever doing it. And I was just sure that it was like some drug activity, people, or, or something from across here. So anyway, I knew it was a person. I never thought it was spooky, you know, Twilight Zone stuff. I thought it was a living, human, breathing, human being person. Somebody who knows to get in and out of the house without locks or whatever, with or without locks. Okay, so it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I... I woke up, I, it seems like I heard a noise, but I don't know what I heard. I can't recall a noise. I just know that I wake up if I hear a noise with kids, especially you want to do that. And I, I said, Mike, there's cops out here. They're all over the yard. And I'm like shaking him, you know? And he's just laying there, just like a dead weight. I'm like, Mike, wake up. He's usually hard away. Yeah, oh, he gets right up. That's wrong. What's wrong? What should I do? Because he gets up at all different times of the night anyway to go to work. And, but I could not rouse him. And the first thing I, and I was looking at the, um, I was in the, we were in the bedroom, obviously, and the, the uh, mini blinds were down. I could see this blue flashing light, real pretty blue. Um, it, it was like an um, ultramarine, kind of a, um, a real pretty blue, azure, bright blue, bright blue. Very bright turquoise light, I would say. Clear, like a Christmas tree, had a little light on. Anyway, it was just strobing away. And I mean fast, really fast. Blue, I thought, oh, blue, there are cops blue, out here, there must be two or three police cars out here. They have caught these people. Wait, but Mike, this is so cool. I can wake him up. And I thought, eh. And which normally, see, looking back on it, I should have been going, why can't I wake him up? This is weird. It didn't even occur to me. I was like, eh, I can live without him. And I got up, <laughs> I went to the window, the back window, and I couldn't see anything out there at all, except the reflection of the light. And I figured out, it looked like it was coming maybe from the front yard. Because it was real bright. It was real bright. So I left, I had the sh the, I put the shade back the way it was, and I went and I looked at my daughter's room, glad that I thought that, you know, these policemen had finally caught somebody, but on the other hand, isn't it a shame we have to have this kind of activity in our neighborhood? This is where you want your kids to grow up. <laughs> and I'm looking at my daughter's room, and there's nothing over there. I'm just sure it was that house. It's horrible to say, because it sounds like I'm stereotyping, but I mean, there are other black neighbors that I have that are wonderful. It's just these people with like pigs for, for anybody. <laughs> so anyway, um, I realized I couldn't see it from there and I looked in on my son to see that it wasn't waking him up and he was fine and I crashed into a toy in Heather's room which is not unusual because it's like it's, as far as the eye can see toys and I hit it and made a big crash and oh my god I'm gonna wake her up and she didn't wake up. I thought good thing. So I, and I just hurried out here. My dog usually lays right on the other side of this wall, right where she can see everything that's happening. But she was laying like right where this ottoman is right now, that little hassock thing. She was laying there because that wasn't here at the time. And um, she was just laying there and I was like, oh, Ginger, let's see what this is. And she didn't get up and I was like, eh. And then, usually I'm like, you know, go see. And then I just had this weird indifference that settled over me. I was just like, you know, oh, well, people don't wake up, everybody's a zombie, that's fine. She didn't wag her tail. Usually, even if she's tired, she'll just thump, thump, thump her tail. But I don't recall her eyes opening anything. In fact, I don't even remember caring. It's like, like I said, and I didn't care. Right. So I came right out to this window. I looked out this window, and I realized, oh, it's coming from over here. Then I looked back and said, Ginger, don't you want to see what's going on? You know, because I always talk to my dog, she's quite crazy right there. But anyway, um, I looked back and she didn't do anything, but you can see the glow in the kitchen of, the, I had a little white light on the table, that little light has a regular light, and it was glowing brighter and dimmer, brighter and dimmer. I thought, oh, you must, yeah, and I thought, oh, we're going to have a storm. It didn't occur to me that we need weird this going on, whereas now I realize I'd have been going, oh my God, it's happening. And so I was just like, oh well. No. And I looked out here, and the street light was was um, strobing, you know, like flicking on and off. And it would get real bright, and it would dim down. Yeah, it would flick on and off. Uh, no, no. I think it was doing different from this. It was like it was getting a drain on the power. Now it, it seems I don't know, but they did come and they changed the light bulb. Not too much. Sure, sure. Sure. Okay, I had on a um, short nightgown for the summertime. It's like a green paisley and has um, blue um, 
to get a strap and it has a rogue that matches. Everything I buy, I always get something that has a rogue that matches. When you have kids, you never know. It's just hard to get a hot You know, this is how I think my mom made me paranoid, but anyway. Um, I always want to have something that I go to the door and look presentable, not like, oh, little sleeves, you know. Um, so, so I put my robe on. I didn't know. So I put the robe on, I tied it in a bow, which I always do because it's, you know, I'm seeing that stuff like that, and then it will stay. And it, it matches it. It's like a kimono, but just a robe. And I, I put it on as I'm coming out, and I was tying Put the robe on. And I looked out the window, and I was looking out the window, and I realized, you know, the light and everything. And I saw this blue real bright. And I thought, that is pretty. And I thought, something's really wrong. The light's flashing. That's flashing, and that's the last thought I had. The minute I realized something is majorly wrong, and I suddenly felt, I could just feel like this, I can't tell, it's like a wave coming over me of, oh my God, something's horrible. Mm -hmm. Before I got the thought through my own mind, that's it, that's all I know. And when I went to, I, I don't even remember going to bed, but when I woke up, Mike was gone, I thought, that's done. He didn't even say goodbye to me when he left. He usually tells me goodbye. We both get up, and he gets ready, and he leaves. And then I lock all the doors, especially after all this people coming in and out of the house deal. I would always lock all the doors. So that night, I didn't do it. Um, he told me later that he couldn't, that I just didn't want to wake up, that I was kind of cranky. I was like, let me sleep and leave me alone and go away. And <laughs> that's how I was, and I'm usually not like that. So um, anyway, uh, while I was laying in bed trying to wake up, as I was waking up, I heard the kids, the radio, the piano, the, um, it was summertime now, of course, so both of them are home, I don't have to go anyplace. They had the cartoons going and everything, and everything's too loud, they got TV on here, TV in there, and doing everything they aren't supposed to. And I realized, it must be like 10 o'clock, and I hadn't got out of bed, and I sat up, and as I was trying to sit up, I felt, my head just felt a ringing, chinging, a chinging, if that makes any sense, inside my head, pain, right on the top of my head. If somebody had taken a baseball bat and just gone kawang on my head, it was just a horrible, horrible hurt like I, I can't explain. It seemed to be ch chinging, just right from the top of my skull, right down to the side, so it's right to the head. It was just horrible, and it was just a pain that went down. Had you ever walked out with that before? Never. Never, except when I was in the hospital after having my little girl that had an epidural, and it really was bugged me in the same kind of pain. So I thought, I've got something like that. And I indeed had this horrible pain right here, like right in my kidney, right in my back, on the left side, right on my back, right here. It hurt so bad. And when I, I, I sat up and I was like choking myself, I couldn't figure out why, because my robe was on backwards. And it was tight around my neck, the collar. It was usually in back, it was tight around my neck. And, um, so the opening of the robe was in back? It was in back. Oh, well, exactly. And the, um, my, what the horrible knot was that was hurting me was indeed a knot. My robe has a um, sash that matches it, and it was tied in like a big gangly six or eight knots. Like somebody tied it once and said, duh, it's not holding, and did it a couple more times. It was a big gangly gaping knot. Horrible. I, I, and I tried to turn around so I could only do it, and I think, I was thinking, oh, I used to be really losing it. At the same time, I felt like I was going to be violently ill. My head was killing me. I felt like I was going to be sick. I did get sick. Well, I had... Whoops. Attack, Wait a minute. Ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, we're out of time, but, uh, you, know, you know, you can see it takes a while for her to say anything <laughs> because uh, the, the details are extreme. But this case, I'll just do a one-minute wrap-up on this. Uh, basically, her baby doll nightgown was found out in the living room. You know, the kids are just eating Pop-Tarts, watching cartoons, having a good old time. And she was, she woke up in a robe that she obviously had been put on backwards where they tied a huge knot in the back and she felt like she'd been run over by a truck, uh, so forth and so on. Upon regression, of course, it all came to light that, you know, she sees the weird blue light and that's the last thing she remembers. Uh, once she gets regressed by David Jacobs, uh, she, the door opens, there's a tall guy standing there, sort of a tall Nordic or a Billy Idol kind of looking guy or vanilla ice or whatever, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here to take you away kind of thing. And there's smaller beings walking around that are, d could not possibly pass for human. They're much shorter. And they were in a bunch of garb. They had these um, helmets on with visors 
and a, a strange device on their chest, and they were just just combing through the neighborhood. I mean, you know, if they find a Coke can, they're picking it up, and, you know, here's a rock, and, you know, there's just studying everything, and there's uh, 20 or 30 of these guys fanning out, and she goes up to, there's, there is a device on her, right where she thought all these swirling lights were a police car, but then she realizes it's too bright, <coughs> there's something wrong with that. Uh, they lead her out, and she sees this thing. It's only about eight or nine feet in diameter, and it's not very tall. And she thinks, man, I hope they don't put me in there. There's no room. And they said, don't worry. That's just to sec secure the area. We're going up there. And then she sees this huge, uh, like, I, I can't remember if it's donut-shaped or circular. I think it's donut-shaped, this huge mothership. And she goes up there and has an abduction that involves medical stuff and so forth. And she was able to look down on the neighborhood and actually see things like, oh, they did get that pool put in. And oh, you know, I mean, she was able to confirm uh, details. And the case goes on and on. And it became a nest of abductees. Like some, one of her friends gets picked up with her. It's like this huge thing. She finally realizes after working with David Jacobs that she's been abducted all her life. And this whole scenario unfolds. And she realizes that this was the one event that sort of was this touchstone to it all. But a huge library of information came out. And you're probably wondering, well, why was it so important to David Jacobs? How did it, what was so important? And the important salient point was that she said the, that the, the person, the hybrid, told her, this blonde guy said, my mother was like you, but my father was like me. In other words, my father was another hybrid, but my mother was a human. In other words, that's what gave David Jacobs the idea that their, the, the breeding program is not uh, one part human, one part alien, let's go. It's not like that. It's, it's a very subtle DNA stripping and adding. And they'll, you know, these hybrids that can pass for human, uh, this is a David Jacobs scenario, they're probably 98% human. It's just they have had to work and work and work with this gene splicing idea. And that, that made him say, aha, you know, th that was the case. So that, that, that's a local case that really uh, changed the course of uh, abduction uh, history. So when did this happen, this case? Uh, well, my little card that had the date on it, I left it back there. But I believe it was, um, yeah, there's the card. Rob has the card. That was Rob's voice in the background. I, it was the one abduction case where I said, we've been selling so many abduction cases, I, I can't go again. And of course, you kick yourself because it turns out to be this big bellwether case. But I think we can make a smooth transition to Rob because he's all queued up here. As long as, do you know how to regain the signal? How that works? <laughs>